there's a theme in the book that many people really resist the search to price the price list that they think that 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 kind of applying market mechanisms and market language and terminology um kind of devalues things that we think are priceless and they really resist taking something as meaningful as the environment and, and trying to price it um and i i saw one what you used one phrase in something that, that i read um that people think of prices, especially in cap and trade, maybe people think of prices as penalties, but there's so much more than penalties, there are opportunities, I think was the word. Um, so could you say a little more about why you think people resist this idea of applying financial thinking and markets uh, to these and, and how you overcome that? Yeah, I mean, I, obviously there's a metaphysical component. You, you can look at the, the slide of the planet and you can see it as the earth with, a halo, or you can see it as just water and land. You know, there's it, there's a metaphysical quality to anything to do with with the planet because it's something beyond our comprehension. How did we get here? Where are we going? Um, I also think, and I've I've uh, and maybe it's not true here, but it's certainly true in general society that financial terminology, anything to do with finance, most people don't really understand how the macro economy works or capital markets. Certainly, as I said. This book was Paula Meets Environmental Economics. And there's really a vocabulary short, a canyon between the communities of who, who work money and those who don't work money. And that has created a certain mindset too. Um, the other thing is that I think that there's just a fear. There's a fear because we have, we, you know, colonialism, capitalism have, have been driven by ch the chase for profit and the chase for resources. So if we're going to somehow now take those systems and turn them around to do the opposite, it kind of defies credulity a little bit. And that's where I you know, think the tolerance of ambiguity and examples. I think the only way you, know, you, can, you can try to joust an argument directly or you can overpower it with the alternative examples. And I think we're beginning to see that turnaround. And so some of the examples like this, I think, can give us credibility and you know the carbon markets, I think, suffer particularly because they're very they've become overly complicated, and um, science, climate science, is uh, difficult to uh, uh, it's a hundred you know you can't get 100 percent accuracy from that kind of uh, calculation. Or you plant 100 trees and they're sequestering a certain amount of tonnage, and then there's a storm. Well, so they sequester less, and people immediately consume well. Then if, if, the, if the carbon credit is worth the original number of tons sequestered and then there was a storm, then there's a fraudulent premium going to somebody. That's just the conclusion that people come to automatically. Whereas obviously science, contracts, satellite monitoring, you can now tell from satellites where every tree is and you can almost calculate sequestration, sequestration value from space. So it's very hard to defraud things unless you really want to commit fraud. And there'll always be fraud, you know, somewhere.